Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Robinson, psychotherapist in Austin, Texas. I'm here today with Georgia Marvin as a part of a series of interviews with expert practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. In this series, we interview a wide variety of experiential practitioners so as to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential methodologies. Georgia is currently a senior trainer with the Hakomi Education Network and the Vancouver team. She uses Hakomi to serve the needs of individuals and couples in a private therapeutic setting. And having a background in business and governance, she introduces Hakomi technology to organizations to expand their understanding of leadership and team building. Her passion is teaching groups and mentoring advanced students in the method. Having studied with the founder of the Hakomi method, Ron Kurtz, for 10 years, and having been named by Ron at his death as one of his legacy holders, her intention is to contribute to the growth of Hakomi in the international, international community and the sustainability of his legacy. So nice to have you here, Georgia. I really appreciate it. Let's let's jump right in. I know that you um, specialize, obviously, in Hakomi, and I'd, I'd love to hear about how it's experiential, what makes it experiential, and um, maybe even actually starting with a brief kind of, this is what it is, too, just for people who don't know, it would be great. Okay. What is Hakomi? I have a great video of Ron um, talking about uh, Hakomi, and can you make an idea as simple as possible so that you could explain it to your grandmother. <laughs> so if I were to explain it to my uh, now deceased grandmother, I would say something like, Hakomi is a, is a very gentle, respectful way to help people self-study, to help people understand the patterns that are that deeply organize their perceptions, their relationship, relationships, their uh, understanding of the world, uh, their capacity to engage in the world. So Okomi is a, a simple, genius way to understand oneself. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like a, a very necessary endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> for um, any grown-up human yeah i'm curious actually about self-study um which maybe we'll get into a bit later um just in terms of like yeah i have questions about once you get familiar with it you know is it the sort of thing you can just do you know without a practitioner sort of guiding it but maybe that will come up later well let's know let's go for it now mm -hmm. you know ron called it assisted self-study if, if it were just self-study, then I might say to you, Sam, just go into, you know, go into a hut in the jungle and hang around with yourself for 30 days in a row and you'll probably learn something about yourself. <laughs> but it's assisted self-study. And so it really has this beautiful relational quality where I, as a Hakomi practitioner, create relationship with you and that gives the context for self-study because I'm on the outside of your experience. I'm, I don't see the world through your eyes so I can catch the elements that might not be true or might be limiting to you or might be restrictive in the way that you uh, experience the world. And so relationship and the quality of that relationship is fundamental in, in this method. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, it's it's not just sit, just let, read about it and then go and do it on yourself. It's assisted, and the and key part of it is the relationship between the practitioner and the client. And the way I teach, I I do some individual work when people call upon me because they have heard about me or they they're curious about a call me. Um, but the same would apply if you, if, the way I teach in groups, for example. So you have these wonderful groups that, uh, that uh, form and then we give them ex experiences, uh, exercises to do where they're together in groups of twos or threes or small groups doing a particular exercise. And so that idea of relationship isn't just between a therapist and a client, it's it's in a whole group where you begin to knit 
a whole group together and it, that creates a context for healing uh, on a, in a group setting. Wow, I'm so curious what that looks like. Like what what would that, yeah, what does that entail? So it's something the group does together in order to create a connection or, or a fertile ground for self-study. Is that what you mean? That's right. So for example, I'm hosting a group tomorrow. And this group is the beginning of a, a whole training that I'm doing, a live training. Most of my training has been online since COVID. Uh, but this is the first uh, really live training that I'm doing. So as I think about that first day, these are people, I know them, but they don't know each other. And so one of my fundamental um, goals is to is to start this group in, our, in relationship, like start to knit them together in relationships. So they're all going to come. And the first exercise I'm going to have them do is to go in pairs and to find something in common, not Hakomi. <laughs> and also to talk about, just have a conversation like, why, why are you here? What do you hope to get out of this training? What would you like to learn? And also to perhaps share one thing about yourself that nobody would guess. And then when we come back into the group, I'm going to have them introduce their partner. This is so-and-so, and this is what I understand about this person. And so you begin to have this finding, finding things in common and sharing something a little bit intimate or different or you know unknown about yourself, and you begin to open that door to intimacy in a group setting, and you start to create the context. So that is very typical. Then I'll come out, I'll get a, they'll come out of that into the group, introduce themselves, and then I'll talk a little bit about the method. And the next exercise that I'm planning is a very simple exercise called being with. So they're in pairs and they both start with their eyes closed. And when they're ready, they're gonna open their eyes. And as soon as they sense any kind of reaction, you're going to close their eyes and study the reaction. The other person is doing the same thing. So sometimes both people have their eyes closed. Sometimes both have them open. Sometimes it's one or the other. And the purpose of that is to study yourself. What happens automatically when you're in the presence of another human being? Where you, there's, not, there's no conversation. There's nothing that you have to do, but there's going to be all sorts of automatic things that we do when we're in front of a human. And we want to understand that. That's, that's like the whole key. We do these simple exercises, experiential exercises that from which you will learn something. I, I, just to give you an example, I, I've done this exercise many times and every moment is different. Every time it's a little different. And I remember being in front of a woman and doing this exercise, opening my eyes, watching. And what I got, suddenly I realized oh, when I'm in front of another person, my automatic habit is that they want something. They need something from me. Mm -hmm. And so I, of course, I'm like primed to deliver something. And I didn't know that before. I didn't know that's how I was organized. And it was a moment of learning that that exercise allowed me to learn and I've never forgotten that you know like that is that's how you learn about yourself is you have these moments of like aha consciousness comes on board and you recognize something about yourself that you didn't know before and when you learn like that nobody can take it away it's yours nor can anyone predict what you're going to learn in that exercise so the design, the brilliance of this method in the pedagogy part, is, so this is how we learn about ourselves, this is how we learn uh, Hakomi, the pedagogy is experiential. And so the design of the exercises are usually very, very simple, Sam. They're not complicated. They're, you might, I might give a little context 
for it, but it's going to be as simple as possible to leave the widest space for you to learn something about yourself that I cannot predict. As a teacher, I cannot predict what you're going to learn in any particular exercise, but it's going to be like one thing you learn and another thing you learn and pretty soon this is like this beautiful you know layered understanding of yourself and others yeah what a beautiful place to start like if this sort of self-study thing like i i wonder too if it's do you nudge them in nudge folks into sort of trying to like study what's happening kind of below the head or are you just like whatever happens you know if someone was just like well i'm just seeing a lady with blue glasses and a green scarf are you sort of well what's happening in here is what you're maybe nudging them to or is it all of it it's all of it because when you think about it your soma is all our signals that you're getting it from your body the somatic signals but your the physicality of your brain is generating all sorts of other phenomena, you know, phenomena that are we think about as thoughts or label as thoughts or images or visions or, you know, all of that is and your and your uh, emotional experiences as well. So sometimes that's something that I'll include in the instructions is like when you're when you're paying attention to your experience, it's all of that. It's your auditory. It's like everything that you are as a human. So you don't, you know, one of the principles of Akomi is uh, unity, body, mind, holism. You know, it's like this is not a separate, these are not separate entities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm wondering, like, if, if you're, if you're working with an individual, you do you sort of teach the same thing. We're going to have an experience and this is what I'm going to invite you to do. Like, how does that, how does that look? Well, then it becomes more, more subtle because when you're doing a session, you don't do a session as exercises. So instead, uh, if we were to start a session, I might say to you, if you were a new client, Sam, you know, we can start, by you talking about something that's on your heart or your mind right now, or we can start right in the present moment and you can just drop into your experience and, and just notice what's happening and we can go from there. And it's surprising the number of people. Now I'll draw a certain clientele, but there, it's amazing the number of people that will say, let's start in the present moment. And I like that because Hakomi doesn't deal with story. It deals with the storyteller. So mm. I'm interested in your experience and my job as a skillful Hakomi therapist is to keep you reporting, experiencing and reporting your, your present moment experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you go abstract on me, if you go theoretical, if you go into your story, I'm going to do something that brings you gently back into the present moment without interrupting you. But I'll do contact statements or I'll bring your attention to something that's, you know, happening that I see. Yeah, so if someone comes in and they're like, oh man yeah work on Tuesday was a nightmare my boss was just such a pain and she was like moaning at me all day and I just got home and I was shouted at my wife it was terrible if they're just someone's coming in they're just like here's my week yeah what's a what's a thing you might guide them to notice I might say that was really aggravating that's really aggravating because when you were saying that, it's like I can feel the aggravation. So I'm I'm imagining that that might be your experience. And so I'm going to try and name your experience. It's really aggravating. Oh, good. So instead of being like, yeah, wow, she sounds like a nightmare, your boy. <laughs> <laughs> being like, what's the almost like implicit message that this client's sending me and that I can deliver back to them to hopefully nudge them into going like, oh yeah, that was aggravating actually, yeah. Yeah, or frustrate, really frustrating, something like that. And and as soon as 
as you begin to name their present moment experience, if they, if they, their attention goes to that, then usually deeper material is, you know, is underneath that because what's upsetting is our more fundamental things like I, I'm not appreciated or I'm not seen mm -hmm. or, you know, someone's um, abusing me in some way, um, belittling. Things are happening that are hurtful experiences underneath and those usually tap into the more core material so it's amazing that staying away from the story and staying with the present moment yields everything i often say to my students everything that's important that happens in a comi happens in the present moment because everything that you are is right there yeah yeah, I just had a thought too, is like, you know, with the example of the person coming in and talking about their boss. And I imagine if you even reflected back saying, wow, it sounds like you really don't feel seen by her or something. Exactly. You can make you, guesses about that core material. And they may go, oh, yeah. Oh, God, that's a familiar. You know, and then suddenly you're in this like m deeper meaning straight away without just going, yeah, yeah, the boss she's a, should get a new job. That's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, then we're moving into core material, and then what Hakomi does, it doesn't link it, link anything directly to that story because we know that it's a pattern. We always know that these things that are hurtful or aggravating or frustrating as part of a pattern, we perceive it and we and we respond with with frustration. And so if I if if our guess is that it's like you felt unseen and you get some kind of yeah, 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 then if they are ready, I might invite that person to just turn their attention really to notice what happens. And I'm going to say something to you, Sam, and you just notice what happens automatically. And you tell me when you're ready. So usually people who are new, it's like they keep their eyes open and and yeah, yeah, I'm ready. And I might, you know, it's like, it's like a subtle dance. So it's like, well, just for a moment, close your eyes and really pay attention to your whole inner landscape. And when I say these things, and so they might get ready and, and are you ready? Yeah. And they give me a nod. And then I'll say, if it were you, I would say, Sam, I see you. Or Sam, I want to see you. So your experiments are going like right to the core organizing material. And that will usually drop us fairly quickly into something quite meaningful. And then it's a matter of refining those experiments closer and closer to suit the exact experience of the, of the client. So you can see how quickly from that little came home from work and rah, 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 rah how quickly we can move without, well, tell me more about that or, you know, asking questions about it and so on. Because as soon as you ask questions, you interrupt that self-study, you interrupt the experience and you ask the person to go up to their mind, to their cognitive brain, you ask them for an explanation and now they're out of their experience. That makes so much sense. Yeah, you're gonna ask a clarifying question that's gonna just, yeah, keep them in their head. I wondered by asking the client, aka me in this case, by saying, <laughs> Sam, I want to see you, um, are you um, offering them like something that feels like the opposite of what their experience may have been? Yes, exactly. So then they're like, I don't know, wow, no one's ever said that. That feels really that, vulnerable. That's exactly. Or that feels, I feel really exposed, or I don't want you to see me, or like exactly. whatever. Exactly. And and when we do those experiments, the experiments are always potentially nourishing. So if I if I think a client, if I think that a client uh, would react to badly to I see you, I might say I want to see you, or I want I'll I won't judge you, for example, because sometimes underneath that, like if you see me, you're going to judge me, and so you might make that leap experimentally and say, you know, I won't judge you. I, I'll see you. I want to see you and I won't judge you. 
So you want to come as close to their, uh, the experience that hurt, the experience that wounded, the experience that, sh that shut off some of their capacity to trust the world, to be in the world, to take risks in the world and so on. So yeah, you, but always potentially nourishing. Now, as Ron said, the gift that Hakomi made to the field of psychotherapy was the use of precise experiments in mindfulness. And those two elements of Hakomi are very unique. So those experiments, although they are always potentially nourishing, often will create a reaction. And that's important that we want that reaction. It might be an emotional reaction, or it might be like, you know, a cough, or it could be, you know, any kind of reaction. And, and we know we're up against some organizational pattern as soon as we get a reaction. Mm. And so we want to always see that as an adaptive reaction. It's not a problem. We're not looking for problems. We're not looking for resistance. You know, we're looking for how has this person created their world to survive the best they can. So, so deep compassion. Yeah, yeah. The sort of real non-pathologizing stance of yes, whatever the reaction, something in this client's life makes sense of this type of thing. Exactly. So, no matter so, how bizarre the behavior, mm. the most bizarre behavior can still be looked at as some way in which this human organism is trying its very best to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that must feel as a as a client just ha just knowing that the other person is experiencing it like that. It must be really. Um, yeah, meaningful and and safe, even if it's not explicitly said, but having someone's energy be like, oh, what you're revealing to me is coherent. I don't know how, but it is. Yeah. And feeling that from someone is um, probably really wonderful. I was teaching an international group uh, last week, I think, and I did an exercise and it's like an exercise of seeing somebody uh, more deeply. So in this exercise, they're in they're, um, in pairs and they close their eyes and then I'll, I'll prime them and I'll say, so when you open your eyes, you're going to see someone who has saved somebody's life. And they look at the person, of course, their mind is primed to see something great. And then they close their eyes. And the next time that you open your eyes, you're going to see someone who is going to be nominated for a Nobel Prize. And close your eyes. And so all of these different priming, someone who has suffered, now you're going to see a four-year-old. <laughs> and so then in the debrief, we had some comments and I said, so just imagine when you, everyone needs help sometimes. You know, someone needs someone to listen to a situation that they're that they're in. Can you imagine the difference walking into a therapist's office and them seeing like you have problems to solve versus here's somebody who's a real gift in the world. Here's someone who is so unique and so special that they have saved somebody's life at some point. And you could feel the whole room go... You know, there was just this like, of course, I want to be seen like that. Like, you know, I I want to be seen. <laughs> yeah. You know. So, so okay. that's so. So is that how you're like, before you even meet with someone individually, you're sort of doing these experiments of like, I need um, I'm going to find delight in this person, but just because they are this unique person who has probably done some wonderful stuff in their time, or I know has. So you're going in with what's already magnetic. Right. Yeah, I want to see you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And that is the practice of loving presence. 
And you talked about that with Donna. So that's a, that's one of the fundamental practices um, that uh, both Ron and Donna really developed. It's not where Hakomi started. It didn't start with, um, with that as an element. But in the 90s, uh, Ron really had a major shift and he he felt like it, you know, sometimes you do lateral shifts, like you have skills and you add another skill. But he felt with loving presence that his work took an exponential leap. And it was such a, an important leap that he began to do loving presence workshops. And the essence of loving presence is that as a therapist, your state of mind really matters. You're not a neutral, you're, you're part of the dance, you're not neutral. And so if you take responsibility for your state of mind and you can shift your state of mind to one of the, that search for nourishment and that search for inspiration and that, and you practice that over and over and over again, that becomes one of your habits. And that's good for you. <laughs> if you're in that state of mind as a therapist, that could really uh, shift you from a place of overwork and burnout and, and kind of the heaviness of being with people who are suffering to one of actual uh, a, a state of inspiration and compassion. For I was, Yeah, or well, like, yeah, it feels sort of it, the work would be more invigorating than anything else. Um, yeah. I had a question. It might be a cheeky question, but how long did it take you to fully in, to fully be in loving presence? You know, I've been practicing this since since really 2000, 2001. And I had an experience um, a few years ago. So it would have been before COVID. So it's like, you know, a few years ago, but not not that long where I was working with a gentleman and uh, he didn't know anything about Hakomi at all. And he was a, a, a really wealthy person. He'd flown a long way to see me. He'd heard about me from, you know, who knows where, flew across the continent to see me and we were doing, you know, a series of work. And, and for someone who doesn't know Hakomi, and they're accustomed to being really in control of their of their world. It takes a little while to develop that kind of trust so that they can be vulnerable. So about on the fourth day or so, I I really went into loving presence where I I allowed this man's life and situation and his being to really Im imprint me, imp like impress me as if I were soft clay. I describe this experience as if I'm soft clay and someone can leave their their, their fingerprints on me. It's like the, the print of their presence. And so in, in a moment when I really was beholding this person, I said to him as an experiment, you can be the man you want to be. And that broke down all his barriers. I said, I think this is enough for today. He went for a walk, he cried and cried, and I went back and cried. Because that really being that open to someone else and allowing myself to just be so touched by his circumstances, not aggravated by you know, resistance or anything, but just working with him at this deep level. And that taught me one more level of loving presence. So I think it's endless. Like maybe if I were Buddha, I would be sitting in loving kindness all the time. I'm not. I get frustrated or I get this and that and so on. But boy, when I'm working, it's a very deep practice. So you can usually rely on me to be in that state of mind. That's that's so uh, powerful, um, and I'm imagining <clears throat> if you are noticing your own defenses coming up, like I'm feeling angry or I'm feeling frustrated about what's happening between me and the client. Is that's the sort of message of I need to do that? I need to be in loving presence and drop yes. into that now, yes. because it's you know you sometimes you know you can't always prepare for what's going to be delivered or how someone may be sort of 
you know, energetically. So yeah. really having that as something to to call to is like, oh, I'm noticing my own defenses are up and I'm in my head. If I drop into loving presence, I can suddenly reach this person from here again, rather than yes. it's not working or I'm not helping or this person's mad at me or whatever yeah. might come up. Or to give you another example, I can trust myself that I'm usually in loving presence with a client. So I was working with a client and I, I was just so bored. And, but my compassion was there. And I thought, oh my gosh, this person is boring everyone in their world. It's like, no wonder they're lonely. No wonder, you know, like this is a pattern that they have learned that is creating. Uh, it's an adaptive pattern, but it's kind of maladaptive because it's actually creating more isolation and disconnection and so on so I was able to use that I I trust myself it's like no I'm usually I'm not bored I'm not a kind of bored person so I could read those signals as a possibility of maybe this person that's how they present in the world and then I was really open again to how much suffering that causes I imagine though you didn't reveal Oh, I'm, I imagine you do this. This is how everyone that, feels. That is all internal. But how, what sort of experiment would you set up in that case? Well, I don't remember. I remember that moment, but I don't remember what I did. But I would, I would then be looking to, to, um, I would be looking for, to make real connection with that person. Like I would find ways that, that experiments that might be about, you know, I want to connect with you or I'm happy to be with you or uh, maybe this person, what's boring, you know, maybe they're just talking, talking, talking. And, you know, it's like, and so I might think that this person has never really been listened to. And so I might say, I want to hear what you have to say. I'm listening. Take all the time you want. <laughs> Yeah, as soon as I asked you the question, I was like, oh, there's so many possibilities. If this person is someone that experiences people as checked out because they present as boring, having that loving presence and then being like, even like, I really want to see you. Yeah. I know you and like hear about you would yeah. be really powerful for someone like that. It might so, stop in their tracks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. might stop you know it might stop that monologue because it's a monologue yeah wow it's really um so it's it sounds like you're sort of <clears throat> you're in this loving presence but you're also like feeling around in your own kind of intuition about the person's sort of deeper experience like what are they what what can i like draw out from what they're saying which may kind of hit them more here and then we yeah. can sort of keep going in and down yeah because as soon as you hit as long as you're modulating you know to to the person helping them regulate and so on um you can hakomi can move into the deep places really really fast sam um and then you have the the, the art of hakomi is being able to modulate that like what is too fast because sometimes if you if a person opens and they've not been opened ever before and you, it opens too fast, they can like they can close up like a clam, you know, if somebody an oyster is somebody's poking at them. So so it's like that that uh, delicate art of creating relationship and and a nice ground, you know, collaborative ground. And I was just listening to um, a, a video of Ron talking and, and he says, you know, it's, it's not just you working and it's not just the client working, it's the adaptive unconscious of both. And you can rely on that. If you have a good relationship with the adaptive unconscious, it does the work. It's wanting to heal. Healing wants to happen. I love it. You're longing for those experiences. Mm -hmm. Basic, you know, those fundamental uh, requisites of being human, safety and connection and belonging and being seen and heard. And 
Mm -hmm. The big so it's, cat. yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it sounds like they're sort of like what we should be doing. It sounds like that's th those are necessary components kind of in therapy generally, but it sounds like this is also a kind of small enough steps, pacing, matching the client and then ensuring that you are attuned in a way that you're not like hitting them with like, you know, everything you say is just this bang, bang, you know, it's like no slowly like kind of tracking with the client at a pace that feels workable for them. And obviously it seems like the goal is just go as deep as possible in As small they enough. want, as they want. So as a, as a Hakomi therapist, you know, it's not like, you know, the Hakomi Olympics and the deeper you go, you know, uh, yeah, you're the winner or something. It's more like, can you follow the client and the client's adaptive unconscious is going to limit given the circumstances, what they're able to do or, or uh, experience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah that was I was going to ask you actually what's the what's the end game with the Comey but it sounds like that's up to the patient or the client yes well I think the end goal is is healing and the end goal is is consciousness so one of the things that Ron taught was that healing doesn't happen through force you can't make someone heal you can't make an organism heal However, you give them the right conditions and healing happens. So those right conditions are uh, connection, uh, relationship, uh, safety, time, being the kind of person that someone wants to engage with, um, and then just the right time, timing, and trusting mm -hmm. that, not forcing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so really it's consciousness coming on board so if you have an experience um in a session that brings uh some relief some new insight it can happen in all different ways sometimes it's an emotional release sometimes after the emotional release comes all sorts of like oh 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 oh, oh you know and people are starting to put the pattern together and consciousness comes on board and then um, that makes choice possible I think that's the goal of Okomi you know like if you realize something about yourself and then you can take it forward and act on that consciously oh that person isn't threatening me they're not threatening me they're trying to teach me something or you know, the boss didn't criticize me. He's actually ha trying to help me do a better job as a team member or, you know, like you can change your perceptions of how things are rather than ha just having automatic habitual reactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like you're um, <clears throat> sort of guiding people to recognize the unconscious programs that are running in their life yes. and I imagine once you get to some of these knowings like um you know so people are always trying to hurt me whatever it was or I've never been seen people don't want to see me once that's conscious I imagine just every day will provide the person with some disconfirming stuff if they're like well hang on a minute that was <laughs> actually yeah, that has been true in my life but you know Jane next door is not trying to extort me <laughs> or whatever it is so I imagine it's like you're because I know the brain has like a mismatch detector and I imagine once you sort of feel into this deeper stuff and knowings and meanings and all of that that then suddenly life provides you with all of this this confirming stuff and also old patterns old patterns are old patterns so they are going to work automatically and sometimes um uh we talk about deliberate practice so sometimes at the end of a a session I might say to a client, I have a little homework for you. And it might be that when, you know, maybe maybe the work started with a tightness in the gut and we worked from there. So I might say to them, you know, when you, when you get that familiar early signal of tightness in the gut, that means this, you know, used to mean this to you, you can, do you remember what we did? We had your hand on that 
pattern on that tension and then something else happened, you might want to just accompany that pattern and just, you know, maybe the nourishing ex ex uh, experiment at the end was um, the, the war is over or you don't have to fight anymore, you know, and you might just from that early somatic signal where the pattern wants to just explode, you might be able to have the client do something consciously. So we call that deliberate practice because mm. habits don't just go away. They go away slowly as we practice something new. Totally. And I, as you know, I'm sure most therapists are familiar with, you can have these rich sessions and maybe don't see the person for two weeks and it's like we don't i don't even remember what we did so it sounds like continued integration between appointments or after a session really nudging them to go yeah like remember in the session we really tended to that part and we said the yeah. war is over i mean to have that in your um you know list of things i do when i notice this is like you're continuing to kind of heal when the session exactly. is over exactly because that will bring back like all of the things that happened that were potentially healing, it's very likely that it's going to trigger a new cascade of, oh, remembering the tenderness of that or, uh, yeah. It, so, but deliberate, when, when I offer deliberate practice ideas, I try to make it so simple and it's not do this every day. It's like when it comes to your mind or when you get this signal, if you remember, see if you can, you know, do such and such and, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful um how much of the like actual i know you said a lot of it is based on the sort of relationship present moment but how much of it is actually like how are you feeling being with me in this moment or like how can i tell you how i'm feeling towards you and that kind of relational stuff is that part of the process not really. We don't make that overt. What I teach my students uh, to do is to feel the fabric of a of, uh, relationship. So as I'm training them, it's like I'll do an exercise and I'll say, now really, really pay attention in this five minute exercise. Uh, pay attention when you come out of the exercise to what's the quality of the relationship with, with the person that you're with? Can you name the particular quality of it? So, and, and it's usually a somatic relationship is very somatic. We don't, often don't pay attention to that, but when you do, you really can sense, you know, if this relationship is very playful, if it's just, if it's deep and tender. And so people begin to develop those, that, those conceptual uh, uh, experiential uh, repertoire of how you feel relationship. And so in a, as a therapist, as I'm training people to become therapists, Hakomi therapists, it's like, that's essential. If you can't feel relationship, <laughs> I don't think a Komi is, you know, is the right venue. Mm -hmm. So you're but, not, you, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say, I don't want to, um, I don't want to dismiss any other form of therapy, but for the Hakomi, which I teach, it is so relational that that is really, that is really essential that people are able to really sense uh, relationship yeah that may, it makes a lot of sense I mean it, I was going to say it's like um, yeah you wouldn't reveal to the client I'm feeling this towards you but maybe if you had a somatic sensation that were, that might be the setup for the next experiment like I'm feeling this something about this and now I need to use that plus my intuition and what I know about this client to set this other thing up which I imagine would be tricky if yeah like you said you can't feel relationally or that's not accessible to you um because when you were saying um feeling the fabric of the relationship you're just teaching therapists to have that as their inner experience not you wouldn't say to a client like what's the fabric of our relationship like now it's like the inner yeah yeah okay yeah 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 is there people you've worked with that it's like trickier or harder for them to 
engage in this type of work um yeah you know, so, people, so, yeah, you know so, like people who sort of maybe have adaptively learned to intellectualize a lot i imagine i don't know those folks trickier to drop into this type of experience or what's that like well i have um i have a a, a client who is fairly young and has been through a trauma. And what I realize is that just my being with her, I listen to her, she tells stories, she tells me all sorts of things. I ask questions, which in her call me in a regular call me session, I don't ask any questions. So I'm adapting to her in order to create the relationship, keep it nice and solid. Because every time we do a little experiment and we go close, the signals that I get back is she is not ready to dive into what's happened. And it's fairly recent. And so I just read that signal and I just drop back. I'm, ju I'm just being here with her. She'll find her way. I don't have a recipe for her. I don't know what her healing journey is going to be, but I know that I can provide an element of that healing in just being with her and being patient and not pushing her in any in any way. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, at first it confused me. It's like, I'm really skilled at this. Like I'm, I'm usually working with, with people who can, even if they don't know the method, they can drop pretty fast. So she's really teaching me a lot about how to um, just keep steady, steady in a place where she her whole life has been mm. but changed. Yeah. So her system is really saying this, I'm getting up to that edge and I can't go beyond it. Exactly. So your job is just to be like, so how is how is it what's coming up for you now like how is just you're just staying right where you are rather than i wonder what it'd be like to nudge you a little bit further exactly every once in a while i test it you know i test it with an experiment and she does the experiment and and then i get this message again it's like don't don't touch my heart <laughs> it's like i'm not going to touch your heart until you're until you're ready and I also use different techniques. So I'll I'll remember, for example, and care about a visit that she's had to her family and tell me about that and what happened. And so I use a like a different I feel like I'm I brought out a different tools set of tools for for her um that is different from my regular client. So I think that. That's a really good example where you have to read the readiness of the client. Probably, you know, I'm not, I don't know other methods, uh, but I am sure that this is true of, you know, all sorts of methods. Like what is the client ready for? Mm -hmm. And can you be patient and wait for when they're ready for what you have to offer? <laughs> There's a lot of trust in the client. Like it's not, I love that it's not just like, well, you're going to come to Hakomi and this is where we're going to head. So let's go for it. It's like, yeah, I've used this, I've used this analogy before, but it's like, you know, you're sort of, uh, the, the client is driving and you're just, you're just saying, I wonder what it'd be like to just go left or just go right. And they're like, mm, all right. And then, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, okay. it's not, it's not like you're driving them and they're sitting in the back and you're like, come on, let's go. Which is okay. really like you said it at the beginning, actually, um, about the healing and i can't remember what you said respectful way to self-study um i can't remember it was something well wonderful. healing you know one of ron's most fundamental teachings for me is that healing is real and powerful and it the potential lies within the client so it's not up to us as therapists to provide them with healing we can be the we can provide the context for healing and when you think about healing in general like if you came upon a tree and there was you know somebody hitting it with an axe right and it's broken part of the part of the bark um it will heal itself it will form its own 
you know, give it time. And as long as the whole bark isn't ringed, you know, give it the right conditions, it, it will heal. If you cut your, you know, if you cut your finger, sometimes it's just, Clean it up and put a bandage on and it will heal. You don't have to heal, heal, heal. You, know, you don't have to do that intentionally. And Ron said, that's how the mind works. Give it the right conditions. So we just have to know what are the conditions for this particular person. Mm -hmm. And for every person, it's particular. Mm -hmm. I also we have like general, general woundings, right? Generally categories and conditions and so on but for each one of those it's it's so particular and that's what i love about it Komi, because it's really creative and it doesn't come with recipes and you can't say if this is you do this for this it's like you just build a repertoire and you can use your own experience and your own you know you were talking about having a gut sense of sometimes you can use that you can use your experience with clients you can just use this whole repertoire as long as as long as you're setting it up as an experiment and testing your idea out because it's one thing for me to say sam i think that you know maybe it's really important for you to be seen so why don't we do an experiment with that that's very different to sam it's really important for you to be seen so you need to blah 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 right mm -hmm. that's that's very prescriptive or you should do this now go home and you should do this or with you blah, blah. Rather, Hikomi invites you into this experimental mode where what ha let's see what happens when I say these words to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I really love that the, <clears throat> there's the emphasis on the therapist's own intuition and creativity and also trusting that you're not going to provide the, the healing that the client is going to do that, which is such an honor for you know, so it's, well, it's a weight off your shoulders as a therapist to, for a start, because you're like, I'm just going to provide the, <laughs> I'm going to provide the key elements here. They're going to do this thing. And it's what a empowering position to take with someone of like, oh, you're going to do this work. Like, I'm not going to give you a worksheet or a whatever, but, you know, we're going to sit here and I'm going to provide this stuff as best and creatively, creatively as I can. And you're going to do the healing. It's wonderful. And sometimes I make it very explicit what I'm doing. You know, sometimes I'll say my job is to sit and be nourished by you, to be really inspired by who you are as a person. And sometimes I'll even name as we go along in the session, you know, what I'm really inspired by is your courage. Or what I'm, you know, what I'm really touched by is how much you've suffered. And that those kinds of statements of appreciation and, um, those really go a long way to build the kind of trust that you need because people mm -hmm. feel seen when you say that as long mm -hmm. as it's authentic, you know, it always has to be authentic. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm sure most people could, could whiff it out if it wasn't authentic. <laughs> um, actually we've got five minutes left. Wow. <laughs> I know it's gone quick. I'm like, I've still got 20 questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about something, Sam. Yeah, for sure. This, this is really important to me. So when Ron died in 2011, he left hundreds and hundreds of hours of writings and uh, hundreds of hours of video and audio tape and, and, you know, documents and so on. And all of that in 2020 was gifted basically to our Hakomi Education Network organization, but to me, and it's in my garage. And so I have been, I've spent the last year and a half digging through the video and editing it and getting it ready. So I have, I call it the archival project, but I'm digging out just, I think we've got 80 hours of video digitized. And of that, we've got 77 uh, short clips for members so people can go to a Comey education dot net and if you you can become a member for eight dollars a month 
and you can access all these beautiful resources that I'm digging up. So this is the originator of the method talking about his method. And it's just a treasure chest. It's precious. And I think one of the things that I'd like people to know about Hakomi is that it, it is a type of learning that you can incorporate into anything you do. It doesn't matter whether you're a nurse in the emergency room. That's one of my students is a ER nurse. Um, it, it doesn't matter whether you're practiced you know, uh, therapist with your own set of tools. This is so fundamental that it can blend with anything that you're doing. I, I taught a team of, of uh, engineers in Microsoft. Now I changed the language a little bit, but this is about being self-aware so that you can be in the world in a more sensitive and robust way. So this is the originator of the method talking about his uh, talking about his method. So I really invite people who maybe they're interested in this. I invite you to come mm -hmm. and participate in that. Yeah, that sounds really great. And also, I love that it's not you don't need to abandon what you know or yourself to to invite this in. Which I'm sure it's is, you know, some methodologies may require that, but it sounds like this is yeah. like going to enrich whatever you're already doing. So exactly. add it in. Yeah. Well, we, had very, have... we had a very seasoned therapist in one of the, one of the early trainings in Vancouver. And after the first day, she said, I have my money's worth. Just the concept of loving presence is going to change my whole practice. So it's like that, you know, you can take elements of this that you think, Oh my gosh, that's rich in goodness for me, I can, I can use that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So people can go to hakomieducation.net and start to see Take some of those up. videos. If you can, if you're a member, if you're a member, okay. you go, you can, you can go into the resources and you mm -hmm. can access the videos. Yeah. Good. So we'll, we'll link all of that at the bottom of the video so people great. can check it out. Um, any last nuggets of wisdom before we wrap up maybe for people interested or wanting to you know dip their toes in more anything you would suggest or say well, well what i would say is hokomieducation.net is a an international organization and it's and hokomi is being taught in multiple languages from russia to china and all in between and so i would encourage you to go to hokomieducation.net you can find a different trainings uh, in different languages, in different parts of the world. Uh, you can also uh, find events online. So uh, Hakomi Education, which we call HEN, Hakomi Education Network, is um, uh, offers monthly events. And Donna and uh, Adama and I, who are legacy holders, have been hosting a resourced and inspired uh, program using Ron's video. So as a member, you can join us on those. And those are online, online learnings. And there's no, no requirement to, you can dip your toe in, no requirement to commit, just come and enjoy, learn something. Sounds great. Well, this was so wonderful. I'm so uh, honored to have spent the time with you. Um, I went fast, Sam. I know. I wish we had more time. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I will, um, yeah, we'll link all of that in the description. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You're most welcome.